Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you tonight about a couple of my favorite things. One being rocks. Uh, I've been a geologist for as long as I can remember. I loved rocks as a kid. Um, I also have been fascinated by Mars. Um, I started out as a traditional geologist um, and got into remote sensing. And uh, on Earth, remote sensing uh, is complicated by to, to look at rocks by the vegetation. So on Mars, this is uh, convenient that we don't have vegetation to obscure the rocks. Um, so that's kind of how I got into uh, investigating the Martian surface. So a little bit of um, background here, and we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more in the talk, but to kind of give you a, um, a preview of where we're going to go, this is um, this image that I'm showing here is a Themis. Um, so Themis is a, a thermal emission imaging system. Um, it's on board Mars Odyssey, which we'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and it's a multispectral imager that captures um, different um, wavelengths of, of um, emitted and re uh, reflected energy from the surface. Um, and you can project these different wavelength bands, um, we call them filters, uh, in uh, red, blue, and green. So you can project different um, themis bands. So for example, this uh, image contains bands 8, 7, and 5. Um, and it's projected in red, blue, and green. What's, what you can do with these types of images is you can start to identify different compositions on the surface. And so what we're sh showing here is a Themis image that's actually overlaid on a MOLA, uh, Mars Orbital Laser Altimeter Topography. Um, what's interesting here, uh, and this is from one of my papers, um, is that we see um, this is kind of a, a low area here, and these blue um, deposits actually turn out to be chloride salts. Um, so it's pretty interesting because chloride salts had not yet been identified on the Martian surface when we started looking at these in about 2008. Um, so that's just kind of where we're going, so that's sort of a preview of, um, of the data sets that I primarily use. Uh, this talk will go over um, some remote sensing, but we're also going to talk about uh, some of the land admissions from Mars as well as some of the meteorites. Um, as a geologist, it would be ideal if we could put our as I say, boots on the ground to investigate the rocks and the outcrops, but we're not able to do that quite yet. So we want to use all the data at our fingertips to sort of integrate them all to get a very comprehensive view of the Martian surface. So um, overview of my talk. Um, so first, just why, why are we interested in Mars? Why do we care? Um, what can the surface composition tell us? How do we know what types of rocks and soils are on Mars? So this is kind of getting at, we've got meteorites, we've got land admissions, um, the MER rovers and MSL, um, and we've got a slew of um, orbiters that are, are, have previously been orbiting Mars as well as are, are currently. And then, um, so that's sort of the results section. And then what do all these surface compositions tell us about past environments of Mars? Okay, so. So the big question, um, and this has been a question for um, decades or so, was Mars um, a frozen wasteland or was it an abode for life? So was it ever habitable? And this is sort of a big question. Um, Mars is the most Earth-like planet in our solar system. Um, if it was wet, um, if the search for life begins with the search for water, so not one of the big driving um, uh, drink big drivers of NASA's Mars um, exploration program is to search for water. As we know it, water, life depends on water. So if we can find water, then we might be able to find life. So whether or not life arose, ever arose on Mars, this is still an important question that we would like to answer. And so these are just two pictures um, of the one of uh, MER rovers, uh, Mars Opportunity, um, and Mars Spirit rover. Okay. So ancient Mars. Um, there's a vast amount of evidence that suggests that Mars at one point was uh, perhaps quite, um, quite habitable, quite wet. So what did it look like? So this top picture just sort of shows um, a volcanic uh, plain um, inside of a caldera. We've got some pictures of explosive volcanism here. Uh, did it ever have an ocean? Did it rain on Mars? Um, so that's shown at the bottom. And then uh, or was it more of a, a barren wasteland like as we see today, which is mostly covered in dunes and dune, um, dune forms? Okay, but before we can really understand Mars, um, we want to kind of know a little bit about Earth and what are rocks on Earth, um, what, what can they tell us and, how, and what kinds of rocks are on Earth? So not knowing um, what all of our backgrounds are, I just have decided to start with the very basics. Um, the rock cycle. So this is uh, pretty much a, um, you get this in your uh, geology 101 class. Um, but 
it's very fundamental in understanding what rocks um, can tell us about a planetary surface. So what we have, see here, we have um, igneous rocks, so volcanoes. Volcanoes are examples of igneous rocks. If, so in this um, slide here, it's a very, um, very precursory, preliminary, um, idealized model of the rock cycle. You can pretty much start anywhere here, and you can weather the rocks, or say that igneous rocks were then um, put under pressure and temperature, and they form metamorphic rocks. From metamorphic rocks, you could then have melting, um, more metamorphism, recrystallization through the continental crust, uh, back to igneous rocks. Um, weathering can uh, then form uh, sediments, and what we, we get from sediments is sedimentary rocks. So you have, under lithification processes, you can form things like sandstones and shales. So that's kind of the um, generalized uh, idea of what, what rocks um, can tell us about where they are formed. So as I mentioned, igneous um, processes. So there are two dominant types of igneous processes. There's extrusive igneous processes and intrusive. So extrusive, um, think about uh, if you've ever been to Hawaii. So extrusive lava flows, um, the Big Island of Hawaii is a, a prime example, and this is actually a, an image from uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. So lava is flowing over the surface. Um, you usually have very fine grain, um, uh, commonly basaltic uh, materials. Um, in addition to that, you can also have explosive uh, volcanism. So if you think about Mount Hood or some of the big uh, volcanoes um, al along the uh, coast of the United States or even down into um, South America. So that would be things like tephras. Um, and then you'd have intrusive rocks as well, and that's another type of igneous process. If you, um, so intrusive uh, rocks would not be extruded onto the surface. They would uh, cool underneath the, the crust of the earth or underneath the ground. You could also have um, them intruded into any type of rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock, other igneous rocks as sills or bathyless. Um, a lot of intrusive materials um, will uh, are uh, mined for ores because they're associated with height the magma is associated with hydrothermal alteration and so a lot of ore bodies are actively mined because of their, their intrusive nature. So, sedimentary processes. So this is what, um, once a uh, rock is weathered, um, these, they form sediments. So any kind of rock can be weathered, igneous rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock, and they're gonna break down the minerals um, into basically sand grains or similar. Um, through compaction processes or sedimentation, so chemical sedimentation can bond those grains together, um, or just having rock pile on, on top of each other, you can have them kind of cement. And this is just an example of um, a sandstone. This, this is in Utah. So this, um, so sedimentary processes can create a, a variety of different types of sedimentary rocks. So we can have clastics, that's like a sandstone. Um, chemical rocks uh, formed through sedimentary processes would include things like evaporites, uh, sylvite, sulfates. Um, so what I was mentioning uh, very early on was the chloride salts that were identified on the surface of Mars are actually a type of chemical sedimentary rock. And then the biochemical sedimentary rocks are things you'd find, uh, you'd find limestones. Um, so if you're on the coast, um, you might actually see uh, limestones being formed. If you've been to Indiana, where I'm from, you're very familiar with the amount of limestones that can be deposited under uh, very quiescent, very calm, uh, shallow ocean waters. As well, so coal as well as chert can also be um, a biogenic sedimentary rock. So the last type of rock is a metamorphic. Um, and so what that means is that any rock, so again, a igneous rock or a sedimentary rock or even another metamorphic rock can undergo um, changes, chemical or pressure, um, chemical or physical changes from either increased temperature or increased pressure. There's two types of metamorphism. Generally, there's contact metamorphism, and so that's when magma is injected into a country rock, any type of rock, and that heat from the uh, injected hot magma will, um, pr will change the composition of the rocks that it's surrounding. Generally, as you move out from that cooling body of magma, you're gonna have different uh, degrees of metamorphism. So less further away, more metamorphism closer in. So it kind of creates a zone. And then regional metamorphism is things you'd, um, is areas where you would see um, large uh, changes in rocks. So you'd have very high grade metamorphism in uh, tectonically active zones, so subduction zones. Um, you can have uh, 
I think I actually have, yes. So metamorphic facies. So in large subduction zones, we have a lot of temperature, a lot of pressure um, variations and increases. You can get things like granulite facies and eclogite facies. So this is just a, a, a very um, rudimentary uh, plot of the different types of metamorphic facies. So if you have very little little temperature increase or a very little um, pressure increase, you just have diagenesis. So that's basically burial of your, your sediments. Um, as you increase in temperature, you can get a variety of uh, different types of um, metamorphic rocks. So hornfells are, can be created from limestones that have undergone just a, an increase in temperature plane, chain, an increase in temperature, which changes the mineral structures. If you would increase the pressures, um, you could also get things like granulites. Um, if you got, if people have been up, uh, there's very, um, there's some gneisses um, and other uh, types of metamorphic rocks, rocks just uh, up the canyon. So you can actually, if you make a traverse up Boulder Canyon, you'll start with a sedimentary rock, which is the flat iron, so that's a sandstone. As you move into the canyon, you'll see um, a granitoid type of rocks. Um, and then as the free, it's get further up into Netherland, you'll actually see um, nice metamorphic rocks. So if you're interested, you can go see some cool geology just right out the way. Okay. So now we have kind of a precursory idea of what rocks are and what, what they can tell us. Um, we, how can we determine what rocks are on Mars? So fortuitously, um, we have meteorites from Mars, um, and I'll uh, briefly describe how we know they are meteorites from Mars. Um, we have land admissions. So the, we have rovers on the ground that can tell us about um, the outcrops that they're seeing or the soils and rocks they're seeing. And then we have orbital observations. So as I mentioned before, um, my specialty is really in looking at orbital data and trying to understand uh, bigger expanses, broader expanses of a surface. But I think to get a, a, a very uh, a comprehensive view of the Martian surface, you really need to integrate all the available data sets. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. Okay, so um, to start, so the Martian meteorites um, have a very similar signature to um, uh, the Viking lander's um, elemental uh, um, atmospheric uh, uh, chemistry. So before um, Viking landers, which I actually uh, will get to in a little bit, we didn't really, we, ha we knew there were meteorites that may have come from Mars. We weren't quite sure, um, but because after the Viking uh, made measurements of the Martian atmosphere and it matched some of the um, elemental uh, abundances in the meteorites, we could then therefore say for sure they are from Mars. The problem with the Martian meteorites is we don't know exactly where they're located on the surface. So we have a very uh, nice suite of meteorites which we can um, use to understand the Martian surface, but we can't tie them to any one particular point just yet. Um, there was some work done to try to um, to find where they might have come from. And we have some vague ideas, but as, as yet, we don't quite know exactly where they come from. So, um, but what they're called, so they're um, shirkatites, nocolites, and chastignites, and they're generally called SNCs. Um, and they're all basaltic in nature. So again, basalts, uh, Hawaii, think of Hawaii uh, flood basalts. Um, although some of them are cumulates, so they might have cooled below the surface to allow time for some of their grain, mineral grains to form. Um, what we do know is they are derived from different sources, um, but their ejection ages seem to cluster. So a few of them, so it's, it's possible that they were probably ejected in, in similar events. Um, there is a wide range of crystallization ages, about 400 million years, which suggests sort of long-lived volcanic activity on Mars. Um, however, their crystallization ages are quite young in comparison to the Martian surface. So what we have is a, a, a sampling of fairly young um, rock hand samples, meteorites. Um, and so we're still working on trying to understand uh, why this is. So is it the older rocks were too brecciated and they've just, they, they weren't able to be, um, uh, they, they weren't able to hold together in the impact event um, or not? Or is it just a, a random sampling? So that's still some, some unknown uh, questions about the meteorites. So early telescopic observations, so this is ground, mostly ground-based observations before we um, were uh, able to put insert orbiters um, into Mars, um, into Mars' orbit. Um, what, what did early telescopic uh, uh, observations tell us? Well, they told us that they, there was certainly bound water on Mars, but there was a lot of oxidized iron. So the red nature of Mars is coming, is suggestive of um, Iron, iron oxides. 
Uh, but there was also a presence of an unoxidized mafic component that probably was volcanic in nature. Um, and then the other observations that we were able to make from ground-based telescopic observations was that the seasonal polar ice cap um, was dominated by uh, carbon dioxide, but then the northern cap was dominated by water ice. Okay, so briefly, um, I wanted to touch on Mariner because it's actually, um, uh, it was launched 50 years ago uh, last week. So it was kind of a, it's a kind of cool that um, we're, we're sort of in a, a celebratory um, era, I guess, of Mariner. So um, the Mariner spacecraft, um, there are 10 crafts built to explore the inner solar system. Um, Mariner 4 was launched in 1965 and it sent back the first close up uh, images of Mars. And so yeah, it was 50 years last week. Um, and what it revealed was a very cratered, very cold, um, dry surface. So nothing too uh, exciting from those observations. Mariners 6 and 7, so launched 1969, flew by the equator in the south polar regions, um, although it missed Tharsis and the Valles Marineris, which I'll touch on uh, in a few more slides. Um, Tharsis is a large volcanic province, and Valles Marineris is a large canyon system. So Mariner 9, uh, 1971, was the first artificial satellite of Mars. Um, and it arrived to uh, a planet enshrouding global dust storm. So when we got there, all we saw was dust. Um, but it survived, and it then uh, returned the first global set of the sort of high resolution images at the time. Now we have much, much higher resolution images. But what it did reveal was there was um, volcanoes, very large volcanoes, um, the Valles Marineris, which is this large canyon system, um, and ancient river valleys. Okay, so moving on to the Vikings. Um, so 1975, so the Viking was the first mission to land a space, spacecraft safely on the surface of another planet. Pretty cool. One and two, um, both had orbiters and landers. Uh, the orbiters mapped the planet at a good, pretty good resolution, 30 to 230 meters per pixel. Um, the landers contained stereo cameras, um, meteorology instruments, biology experiments designed, designed to look for possible signs of life. Um, we made the first atmospheric profiles. Um, the biology experiments showed chemical activity, but there was no conclusive science of life. Um, and those, uh, there's been some reanalysis of some of those experiments, um, and it still seems that perhaps it, they were just not well designed to be able to tell us conclusively whether or not there was life. So it's still an ongoing question. And then it determined the surface environment was sterile uh, owing to the ultraviolet radiation. So these are some of the first pictures returned from the Viking uh, landers. So what we can see here is uh, pretty rocky. That red color, um, again, is an indicator of a lot of iron oxide, so very um, acidic environment. Um, so it, it, the lander didn't move. It just pretty much stayed set and uh, made some good first observations. I mean, we, that was a, a big accomplishment to land on another planet. So then in 1997, Mars Pathfinder, uh, Really, this um, was more of an engineering feat than a science experiment, but um, it still uh, spurred public interest, helping to fund future uh, missions. Um, and it also showed us another spot on the planet's surface um, that we didn't currently have data of. Um, the major science results of that mission was that the, there's still more volcanic rocks, um, salts, um, and they had looked like they had been rounded in past floods. Where we landed um, in Chrissy Planitia, uh, the lander is this little arrow there. Um, so potential outflow channels here. Um, all of these sort of channelized areas here could potentially be outflow channels. And this is just a picture of our little rover there on the basalts. Okay, so um, getting into some of the orbital uh, data that, were, that was collected, Mars Global Surveyor um, really revolutionized what we knew about the surface of Mars. Um, it carried uh, a, a slew of instruments, but the three big ones were the Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter, um, and so this has given, give, given us, provided us a much, much better uh, view of the elevation of Mars. Um, the Mars Orbiter Camera, mock, pretty high resolution images um, returned, no, not global coverage, but really showed us the diversity of rock types on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, and then the one near and dear to my heart is the Thermal Emission Spectrometer, TESS. Uh, which is a near-infrared um, broadband spectrometer, and so it gave us a lot of information about um, composition and compositional variability of the surface. So this is um, the Mola topography, and as I mentioned before, so this is Tharsis province, so there's three of the largest uh, volcanoes in the area here. This is Valles Marineris, a large canyon system, uh, significantly larger than the Grand Canyon system. Uh, we've got another, let's see, 
uh, large impacts uh, were prevalent here. Um, we also found there's, um, this was sort of known before uh, MOLA, but we have this uh, global di dichotomy where the northern hemisphere of Mars is quite flat, um, while the southern uh, hemisphere of Mars is, is quite cratered. Um, generally, uh, higher density of craters means older. Um, so what, there's, there's a number of theories as to why the northern hemisphere is relatively flat. Uh, was it a large impact event, quite, quite large, and essentially melted, remelted the crust, and so this is all very young lava flows. Uh, another theory is that it was a, an ocean, um, and there is some evidence to suggest, actually from one of our um, researchers here at last, Dr. Brian Heenick, um, and his co-workers, uh, that a lot of the deltas um, that are observed on Mars actually occur uh, right at the same elevation along uh, this sort of um, dichotomy. So potentially they were suggestive of uh, feeding a, a global ocean. So quite interesting and ongoing work uh, today. So um, thermal emission spectrometer results. Uh, general, so starting off here, we have, so these are the two global maps. Um, I didn't overlay them on topography, but I probably should have. Uh, so what we see is that the, um, the southern highlands, the older, more cratered highlands are basaltic in nature. So what we can do is we compare um, the, the test data to laboratory data of basalts on Earth. Um, what comes out is that they're very similar to basalts on Earth. The northern uh, hemisphere of Mars, so in this area, so reds indicate a higher abundance. Uh, those are more indicati in, um, indicative of uh, a basaltic andesite. So a basaltic andesite is um, a little bit more silica rich. And so we see that there, that the, 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 there are compositional differences. It's not just basalt. The basalt has um, some variations. And why are those variations there? Uh, it could be different magma composition. Um, it could, uh, there are previous researchers that have suggested it actually might be a weathering product. So more silica may mean more clays um, or uh, nanophase silica that have been uh, sort of the, what the basalts have been weathered. Um, so there's still work ongoing. Uh, to try to understand these two differences. Um, but yeah, it, it's so there are, there are certainly differences. Um, I'm le I lean more towards a, a different composition of um, a primary composition, not a, a secondary weathering composition. Uh, the other thing Tess uh, showed us what there was that there was a, um, a, a very distinct uh, spectral signature of he gray hematite. Um, and that was a, a quite a big finding. We didn't. We knew hematite is an iron oxide, um, but this was this was such a concentrated area that it actually um, spurred us to land a rover there. Um, and if and, uh, let's see, about five years after we um, identified this gray hematite. So, let's see what else. The other thing we can do with tests is we could actually um, deconvolve uh, various minerals. Um, and we can make global mineral maps of the different phases. And so what people can do is so we can look at um, olivine distributions. You might notice that there, um, there, are, there are areas that don't have any um, test signatures. The reason that is because it's too dusty there. It just shows, it just looks like Martian dust. Um, so orbiting spectrometers like TESS and Themis and CRISM and Omega, which I haven't talked about yet, we can't really see through dust. We've got a sensitivity of only a few microns. So if there's dust on the surface, we can't see what the rocks are underneath. So that's why there are some areas that don't have any um, data because it's too dusty to see. So generally we can see that, um, so olivine still again clustered sort of in the Southern Highlands, uh, high calcium pyroxene. So the igneous uh, minerals more st are stronger, have a stronger presence in the Southern Highlands. Um, let's see. Okay. So moving on, so Mars, Mars Odyssey. So unfortunately, um, MGS uh, was lost, um, let's see. Uh, I think it was lost in 2004 or five. I don't remember the exact date, um, but it's no longer uh, operating. Mars Odyssey still is. So it was launched and arrived in 2001, um, and it's, it's still going strong and returning good data. So what I'm showing here, um, a few highlights of this mission. Uh, Near-surface ice deposits were identified by um, the Mars gamma ray spectrometer, um, as well as um, we, Themis, uh, the instrument that I primarily work on, we've, we can make te surface temperature maps, um, so that's shown here. It's overlaid on MOLA topography again. 
And so we can show what, what surface temperature maps show us is how rocky or how um, unconsolidated a surface is. So brighter areas indicate a more consolidated, um, rockier surface, um, and cooler areas indicate uh, more fines. So think of sands or um, silts. And the reason, is, um, the reason that is, is if you think about uh, at nighttime, so this is primarily nighttime data, uh, if you have, if you're standing on a, um, a sand, uh, if, you're, if you're going to the beach and you're standing on the sand, it's very hot during the day and the cement is cool. If you were to stand in the same cement uh, and sand at the, in the evening, which would be cooler and which would be warmer? So everybody, and so the sand would be cooler, it loses temperature faster. The rock would keep that temperature in. So that's kind of the, the idea behind surface temperature mapping. But getting to the a little bit more, to me, exciting uh, aspects of um, the, this mission was the Themis instrument. So this is a multispectral multi -spectral spectrometer um, imager. And so what you can do here, as I described earlier, is you can take um, different bands and project them as red, green, and blue. And when you start to look uh, at these different images, you can tell things about the surface. You might not always know exactly what the, the surface composition is um, immediately, but you can have some ideas that there are certainly differences. So at Themis, one of the main findings was there was a lot of olivine-enriched basalts here. And so this is an image, a Themis image, um, and you can see some compositional variation on this side here. This is just a daytime uh, band nine radiance image. Uh, so it kind of shows you different, um, uh, so the daytime data will also show you what's, what's warmer and cooler, um, but it's more for understanding the geomorphology of the surface. So um, what I've shown in this plot is just an example of what you can do. Um, you can go in and, and pull out into, um, spectra from these images and you can compare them to lab spectra. And so what I've just done here is just shown the differences in these different um, color units. And so it's one of the things we, we do is we kind of look at the Themis data, we identify areas that are interesting, and then we go and pull spectra and we can compare it to lab spectra. And so that's kind of the, the gist of my, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, magenta, blue, and green. It was very rudimentary. So they're just the, the color, um, <laughs> the color scenes over there. This is just kind of an example to give you an idea of how we could go about understanding. Um, in this plot here, uh, the magenta unit is the olivine enriched unit here. And if I should have probably uh, plotted an olivine spectrum here, but it has a deep absorption to the further, uh, farther, um, uh, longer wavelength. Uh, the other really interesting uh, idea um, finding from Themis um, was that we found evidence for uh, magma evolution. So Chris, fractional crystallization. Um, it's fractional crystallization essentially uh, explains how uh, magma is cool and what um, minerals precipitate at what time. So as a magma uh, cools and evolves, they're going to you will find more and more silica in that chamber. So it, that's a very uh, precursory kind of rudimentary understanding of that. But what we saw here was we've got a very dark color and then a very uh, light colored, a uh, yellow colored um, unit right beside it. Looking at cross-cutting relationships, this, um, more, this purple, more uh, magenta unit is older than the yellow uh, unit here. Pulling spectra um, from both Themis and thermal emission spectrometer data that I talked about previously uh, suggests that this is significantly more silica rich. So the idea is that, and this is a this is a caldera wall um, all the way around here, is that during this um, the last uh, phases of this uh, volcano, more silica enriched uh, lava flows occurred, and sort of, um, and this had never been observed on on, on Mars yet. So it's a, a lot of the process we uh, observe on Earth, we extend to other planets. And generally, the physics are the same. So what processes happen here also will pro would occur on Mars. But this was a great evidence that, yes, fractal, fractional crystallization and magma evolution do indeed happen. Um, let's see. So another finding was that um, previously, Mars was thought to have been very basaltic in nature. Um, Themis has shown that there is quite a bit more uh, variability on the surface than just a, a basalt flow. So a granitoid unit is, an, um, again, similar to if you moved up Boulder Canyon, uh, some of the rocks after you get past the sandstones are much more uh, silica rich and some are very similar to granites. So these are um, granitoid uh, 
deposits, or outcrops here. Um, so this yellow would be the granitoid deposits. Um, this is just a sort of a, a regional view of where these deposits are. Um, and then this is uh, some of my work, actually, um, from my dissertation. Uh, we identified um, chloride salts on the surface of Mars. Um, and so this was um, one of the first uh, sedimentary type of rock units that Themis had identified. Um, the chloride salts um, were very distinct in these uh, Themis images. They were very easy to pick out, and actually that's just why I started looking through the Themis data as a young graduate student. Got to find a project, need to, need to write a dissertation, look through a ton of images, thousands of images, um, and I started to identify a, a trend, um, and that these were very, somewhat small, um, commonly occurred in sort of channelized areas, uh, occurred in, in depressions and crater here, um, and in sort of low-lying areas uh, here. So after looking into them in, in more depth, uh, looking at spectra, comparing to laboratory spectra, um, we had uh, a fairly strong hypothesis that they were chloride salts. Uh, a later mission, um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, had a very high resolution um, imaging uh, instrument camera called HiRISE, and we were fortuitous that very early on in the mission, we said, hey, we've got a, a deposit that we need some imaging for, would you be willing to take um, some data for us? And they did, and this is what we saw. Um, the, the chloride salts are in these very light-toned deposits. Uh, the surfaces were highly fractured um, here. Um, they kind of occurred in a, a, a fairly um, consistent large layer in crater walls. So it's showing that they weren't just a, a thin veneer of salt, it was actually somewhat thick. Um, and then they sort of infilled um, craters uh, and, let's see, infilled craters and then also sort of eroding out of crater walls there um, and sort of over um, cementing some of the dune forms. We, so, well, we, yes, we, <laughs> mostly I looked through thousands of Themis images and mapped the occurrence of these chloride salts all across the Southern Highlands. Um, what I've done here is just shown uh, where these chloride salts occur. Uh, it is overlaid on a, a thermal emission spectrometer dust cover map. Um, so this is again showing where dusty regions are, bright red, um, where dust free regions are in blue. So it's potentially possible that there are chloride salts in these dusty areas, but they're buried under the, the dust, so we're not going to be able to see them. Interestingly, um, and a conundrum, is if there were a global ocean, why are there not chloride salts in the northern hemisphere? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so it's something we thought about. If, so does that mean there wasn't an ocean? Um, does that mean that the chloride salts are very, very old and, and um, or for whatever reason they've been eroded away? If there wasn't, yeah. This is um, ongoing work uh, that, that we, um, that we're not, we're not potentially sure why they're, they're not there or, or does it indicate there was not a global ocean. Uh, these salts uh, certainly are, uh, in, my, uh, in my research, uh, we have shown, I, I believe, that there are more localized deposits. They're sort of the last of the remaining water on Mars, so they, I don't think they would represent a global ocean. So that's sort of where we're headed with that, but it's still potentially possible. Okay, so, um, Briefly, so I took, so Themis and Tess um, are mostly, they, they were observing the thermal infrared, but there is, um, there were instruments on board Omega, and uh, in just a bit I'll talk about um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, that look at the near IR. So the near IR is actually more sensitive to things like clays, phyllosilicates, and sulfates. So uh, because of the way the um, electronic transitions occur with the bound water in those minerals, the, it's, it's much um, easier to see them in the near IR than it is in the thermal IR. So Mars Express um, had a, a slew of instruments, um, high resolution stereo camera, um, the uh, 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 planetary Fourier transform spectrometer, visible and uh, infrared uh, mineral mapping spectrometer, that's Omega. Um, it also had a subsurface sounding radar, altimeter, um, and it also had a lander, but it, that was not successful. So. I just want to touch briefly on um, the clays and sulfates that were identified from Omega. So the reds are the clay areas where they, they identified clays, the yellows are other hydrated minerals, um, and the blues are sulfates. So based on their um, analysis, they uh, um, 
Biebring et al. in 2006 proposed that because the sulfates are found in much younger terrains um, and the clays were found in much older terrains, that there was sort of a, a global shift in the water chemistry that deposited these different phases. Um, and so that, for many years, we've, um, the community has kind of been un trying to unravel, is this the case? Certainly with the amount of um, iron oxides observed presently and the lack of water anywhere, uh, this would make sense that early on we had a very um, neutral uh, sort of alkaline, almost alkaline waters that precipitated um, and deposited clays. So again, the red um, and some of the hi other hydrated phases, so hydrated silica is mostly I think what they're I identifying here. Um, and then as the waters, as the waters left the surface for, um, there's many hypotheses, um, the waters became more and more acidic and, dis and deposited sulfates. So the sulfates are primarily, were primarily located um, in the Valles Marineris um, and terrains around there. The al alternative to that is that um, in terrestrial environments, you commonly get clays and sulfates precipitating um, in evaporitic lake systems. So it doesn't have to be a global uh, change in water chemistries. You can have many different phases occurring um, within a single sort of um, lake deposit. And there has been evidence for small um, localized evidence for that as well. Okay, so enter the rover. So the Mer rovers, um, this is sort of, uh, this is our first uh, little geologist <laughs> on the planet of Mars. It was quite capable, um, had a slew of instruments. So the pan cam to look at local geology, had a rock abrasion tool so it could grind into the rock. Uh, there was the mini test instrument, so it was a an instrument similar to the test instrument that we just, the, the orbiter, um, the alpha proton, par alpha particle x-ray spectrometer, so that would give us mineral and elemental compositions. Uh, it had a microscopic imager to look at the fine scale textures of um, the soils and the rocks, and it also had a Mossbauer spectrometer that would look at the iron mineralogy. So, the rovers, uh, I just, I like this cartoon. <laughs> um, I just think it's, it's kind of cute. So the rovers were designed for 90 days, um, but they both survived over 2,000. And that's just quite an impressive engineering feat, in my opinion. Um, you know, so this is just kind of a, you know, did I do a good job? Do I get to go home? <laughs> you know, so um, the, yeah, the, the um, Opportunity uh, rover is still operating, um, which I'll discuss, and then the um, Spirit uh, rover is this guy down here is, oh no, I'm stuck. He did get stuck and we lost communication uh, a couple years ago. So, okay, so we've got our topography again. So, so Gusev um, is down here um, and then Meridiani is up here. And as you remember, Meridiani was chosen because of the gray hematite that Tess observed. So we wanted to go check that out. Gusev was, um, was let's see, yes. So Gusev was chosen, um, Gusev Crater here. It was chosen because it had this long linear channel um, that fed into what was proposed to be a paleo lake. So um, that's where we went. This is our landing site uh, in here. This is Columbia Hills. Um, from our, uh, before we even arrived, it was hypothesized there might be some volcanics in here and this is called dissected terrain there. So it just means it's kind of eroded. So when we arrived, what did we see? Well, we saw a lot of evidence for wind erosion. So this is a, a basaltic um, rock on the surface. Um, you can see how it's been scoured here. So a lot of evidence for wind. Um, maybe not potentially a lot of evidence for water just yet. So this is one, one of the first views that we had and we eventually made it up all the way over here. So we were in Bonneville Crater um, and it was looking pretty, um, not a lot of evidence for uh, bedrock, not a lot of evidence for water um, or water derived materials. Um, a lot of this was um, very iron rich soils, um, basaltic class here. So, oops, wrong way. Okay, but then we crossed the contact. Um, so if I go back here, so there's sort of this uh, area in here. So this is kind of a crater. And then as we moved up, there was a contact that as we moved towards uh, Columbia Hills, um, there was an immediate change in geology. So um, there was granular layered, granular layered bedrocks um, enriched in alteration phases, including iron oxides. Um, these were thought to be, have been emplaced as volcanic deposits and or by impact ejecta. 
But there's also aqueous acid sulfate conditions during and or um, after emplacement that best explained the rock alteration properties. And so here's just a, a view of what we started to see as we moved towards Columbia Hills. So we can see um, maybe some layering here, uh, maybe some fracturing. Um, layering generally uh, t typically means changes in conditions. So for when we start to see layering, we start to think about um, what type of um, process would have very thin layers or, or maybe even thick layers and what, um, what, what are the different things that could um, uh, have occurred to make those thin layers. So water being one, um, change in volcanic process could be another. Oops. Okay. Another evidence we saw as we moved towards Columbia Hills, um, this was actually identified by the mini test instrument. Uh, the rover was churning up, so the soil looked very red, a lot of iron oxides. When the wheel got, got stuck, we turned up a lot of this white material. And what this white material turned out to be was magnesium and iron sulfates. So much different than what was on the surface. We just need to dig down a little bit. Um, as we approached Columbia Hills a little, we were a little bit closer. We started to see, um, well, we saw this observation, which is um, a layered uh, material with a little rock here. So what does that mean? Um, what, what, what process could create, force a, a layer to kind of um, be depressed by a rock. So for geologists that study volcanic terrains, um, a lot of these have signatures of volcanics, tephras. Um, what this represents though is water. Um, so if a rock falls into a material that's not yet consolidated, it's gonna sink, right? So this was, uh, this was huge. Um, this essentially, uh, I think this is a science paper that um, really revolutionized. We were, uh, this was maybe two years into the rover um, uh, investigation, and we'd been seeing basalts and not a lot of evidence for alteration. And, and this was really a smoking gun for, no, this was a, it was a volcanic, um, a volcanic area, but it looked more like this. So this is the inside of uh, Kilauea caldera. And so volcanics, but there's also a lot of water here. Um, and so you can see sort of how uh, there's a lot of layering here. You actually do see, they're called bomb sags. So when you have an explosive uh, volcanic event, you get rocks thrown into um, sediments that are not yet consolidated. And you can get these things called bomb sags. So, so pretty cool. So what do we see at Gusev? So the plains were aeolian materials and blocks of typical unweathered Martian basalts, not terribly exciting. Didn't see any, any bedrock. But then when we crossed in these Columbia Hills, uh, they were quite different. So we saw a lot more chemically weathered basalts, the rich in sulfur, chlorine, other volatiles. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw a lot of evidence for morphological, um, chemical and morphological evidence for explosive volcanism. Okay, so Meridiani Planum. Gray hematite, that was our, our observations from orbit. What did we see? So, oh, this is just a, so gray hematite typically forms in water-rich environments on Earth, but we weren't quite sure. You can get hematite in other ways as well. So we landed, what did we see? Uh, well, we saw dunes. Hmm. Yeah, not terribly exciting. Um, we get up to some outcrops though. And this is a, an image of uh, the rover invest using the, I think this is where we still had the rock abrasion tool investigating some outcrop. Um, you can see some evidence for fracturing here. Uh, it's kind of light toned. Uh, and what we saw, uh, I think it was at the same outcrop, was um, this is a pan cam image, so it's false color. This is not real Mars color. Um, but what we see with these spherules um, with a different color weathering out of the rock. And pan cam didn't exactly tell us what these uh, materials were composed of. So what we had to do was use our mini test instrument to basically brush away um, a section of the rock they had no or very few blueberries. We call them blueberries because they kind of look like blueberries. Um, and, and then so we took a, a measurement here and over here. And the difference was that these look just like this. So this is um, one of, this is pretty much what I do all day long, all day long, well, a lot of, all the time, is I look at squiggly lines. And I compare squiggly lines to laboratory data. And so the derived spherules, um, so this stuff here, match very closely to the laboratory hematite. So pretty cool. Um, additional evidence um, for aqueous alteration was a high abundance um, in the APXS data um, for sulfur and chlorine and bromine, um, all things that can indicate um, aqueous processes. And then we also saw evidence for these bugs. Um, and these were um, hypothesized to have been um, actual salt crystals that were um, uh, 
basically um, eroded out or dissolved out. So uh, more evidence for um, water processes. Uh, we also had a little bit of morphological evidence for uh, water-derived sediments. So what this shows um, here is this was sort of our, um, our outcrop uh, view. What you can kind of see, and so some, this is a, um, a geologist's um, interpretation of what these um, layers could possibly mean. This is very common uh, uh, structures um, in sedimentary rocks that are laid down in water. So it's called festoon cross bedding. Um, so you can also get some of these um, structures in aeolian um, wind-derived sediments as well, but I think the combination of uh, the, the chemistry as well as the morpho morphology indicates that it was probably um, deposited in a water-rich um, water environment. So uh, um, opportunity is still ongoing, but some of the interesting findings so far, um, water-altered bedrock, a lot of fine-grained sedimentary rocks um, derived from basalts, um, and then the preferred scenario, really, we don't even read that, is something like this. So we had a water environment that is desiccated um, and then truly desiccated with, a, with dune forms and probably underwent um, this kind of cycle many, many times. Okay, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, brief overview of um, what we found with, the, with MRO. A um, couple of... Uh, High Rise, Chrism, um, and Sherrod were the three sort of main instruments. Very briefly, what Chrism has found, um, in addition to Omega, uh, we found a lot of evidence for clays, hydrated phases, carbonates, and salts. Um, again, sort of the white indicates where um, Chrism observations are uh, present, but there are no alteration phases. Um, and so what we can see here is, um, so the greens are um, crustal clays, so those are clays that are buried. Um, sedimentary clays uh, that are exposed and may have a sedimentary um, uh, uh, stratigraphy, um, and then clays that are actually are observed in um, actual stratigraphy. So this is work by, work by Bethany Elman. Um, okay, and is this going to work? Yes. Um, this is a really cool picture. Um, I know it's it's not it's not bedrock or, or rocks or soils, but this is evidence for um, flowing water on the surface of Mars today. And this is from High Rise. So High Rise um, has taken um, so, uh, images over the course of, um, I think it's a few, uh, one Mars year. And within m one Mars year, you can see these dark streaks that sort of start to emanate and flow downhill, but then evaporate and disappear. So this is a pretty big find, ongoing research to try to understand these. Um, Unfortunately, chrism, uh, which is very sensitive to hydrated water, does not see hydrated water in these streaks. Now, it's a couple possibilities why there might be. Uh, just the resolution of the two instruments are very different. Um, they have found evidence for um, potentially higher abundances of sulfates near these. Uh, so that um, indicates water again. So that's good. Okay. Whoa. So very briefly, this is um, our most recent mission here, Mars Science Laboratory. <laughs> Um, we've just started to investigate Gale Crater. Um, the reason we chose Gale Crater is this mound of sediments here. Um, the rover is currently about there. We're not quite yet to the mound. Um, long history of deposition by uh, numerous processes, um, significant water in the crater, um, and variable chemistry and mineralogy from orbit. And this is why we chose Gale. So uh, this mound that we're hoping to investigate very soon uh, has a lot of different types of alteration minerals within it that will hopefully give us um, a bigger picture of what happened in Gale and uh, what types of waters were present, were the waters habitable. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, this is just a, my little... So, the, the reason, another reason why we wanted to go to Gale um, because, and had this very well-defined sedimentary package um, rock of rock layers is just it's very similar to the Grand Canyon. So if we go to the Grand Canyon, um, there's yeah essentially 40 distinct rock layers are exposed spanning about 2 billion years of geologic history. Um, if you walk from the Colorado River up to the rim, one can study what the local environment was uh, for nearly half of the history of Earth. So the mound at Gale Crater may not give us that much information, but um, it, it's, it's similar. Uh, so a few findings, just very briefly. Whoops. Um, 
identified basalt so far. Uh, this, this is actually a new type of basalt. It's an um, alkali-rich basalt. That means it's sodium and potassium rich. Uh, we've not seen this type of rock yet on Mars, so that's pretty cool. Um, these are a couple of observations that we made early on in the mission. And so this is Mars and this is Earth. And that Earth uh, picture actually comes from an area, oops, just like this. So it's a, um, a channel um, that it's only episodically flowing. <coughs> Uh, but you kind of can see how these pebbles um, originate. So when water flows, it moves a lot of pebbles down, what dries out, and then it kind of gets um, cemented in place uh, similar to this. So uh, evidence for, for water there. And then this is just that same uh, package of rocks that we're hoping to investigate uh, very shortly. We've been doing a lot of driving, um, and uh, they're getting ready to do more science um, on this package of rocks. So um, let's see. Okay, so what do all of our, um, our previous missions and current missions suggest? So primarily, uh, it seems like Mars is still a volcanic planet, but it has been shaped by aqueous processes. Um, and there's a lot of alteration minerals that, that indicate this, so chloride salts, sulfates, clays, carbonates. Um, and the more uh, evidence we have, we have more and more evidence from our landed missions that a lot of these basaltic signatures may be coming from actual sedimentary rocks that are composed of, of basaltic sediments and not primary basalts. Um, and there is local evidence for low-grade metamorphism. I didn't touch on this terribly because we would like to leave a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, but the amount of impact cratering on the surface, there's, that, uh, there's a lot of heat um, associated with that. Burial and, di and diagenesis also occurred on Mars. We don't have uh, a lot of evidence for um, regional grade metamorphism. We don't have tectonics or, t or active tectonics on Mars uh, as we do on Earth. Um, not a lot of evidence for that. So we don't see the, the high grade metamorphic rocks that we do on Earth. So early history of Mars is kind of a schematic of what it might have looked like. Um, so we had um, hydrothermal activity uh, early on, late Noachian to early Hesperian. Maybe we had some uh, rivers and paleo lakes, uh, maybe the global ocean, although that's not um, necessarily uh, conclusive evidence. There's no conclusive evidence for that. Um, but this is the time period where we start to see definitive uh, signs of life on Earth. So if conditions are similar for Mars, we would expect that, um, and it looks like from the geology, that it would have um, potentially had a, a habitable zones um, during that time period. And then as you moved further on to the later Hesperian Amazonian, so this is younger, uh, so older to younger, um, there is certainly ice, glaciers, groundwater, hydrothermal activity um, as we moved on. Today, Mars uh, probably is fairly dry. It uh, doesn't have a lot of evidence for um, on, uh, current aqueous processes. If there is, there is buried ground ice, um, so all the water is probably wrapped up in either the regolith or um, in subsurface aquifers. This is just a, a very kind of a summary slide that I like to show. So we went through a, a lot. Um, so this is just showing all the different, um, so valley networks, outflow channels, gullies, uh, the water altered minerals were formed very early on in Mars history. And then as we progressed um, through time, more anhydrospheric oxides and olivines were present. Um, yeah. So, and my, I think this is my last slide, yeah. So is this ancient Mars? It's sort of an artist rendition of what Mars could have looked like. A basaltic planet, volcanic planet shaped by uh, aqueous processes. So, I, sorry I ran a little bit long, so if you guys have questions, I'm happy to stay as long as you guys are, are, are willing to stick around, so. So is yeah. this a, oh. <laughs> so is this a picture of that Funoris Canyon and I think this is. Um, I think this is just a rendition of a, a. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it has an, a, a particular place on Mars. Um, it was just the one of the prettier ones that I found. <laughs> so, if you Google like ha, you know early habitable Mars, you get some pretty picked artist renditions of what it could have looked like. So, mm -hmm. I heard somebody describe the Vallis Marineris, if I'm saying that right as a kind of a shrinkage crack as a yep. planet cool. Mm -hmm. um, so how would that fit with uh, ever being filled with water or it being formed after right. the water had left? Right, yeah. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a couple of hypotheses on how Vallis Marinus formed. One is it's a cooling crack um, or a, cr a cooling, um, a grobin, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where when that would have happened would have 
potentially been after much of the water had already left. Okay. So it may not have, um, but on the flip side, so there are a lot of sulfates observed in that canyon system. Oh, no. okay. So it's possible that um, depending on the timing, um, it would have been a very acidic water that would have been filled um, if, if it, the other hypotheses are that it was a cataclysmic outflow event. Okay. Um, and so I don't, uh, I don't know if there's evidence. Uh, I don't think that's a, a um, conclusive yet. I, I don't think we have a, a firm understanding of which one it was. The other yeah. thing I noticed from the top uh, topographic maps was that it looked like the base of that canyon was roughly the same level as the northern hemisphere flat area. Yeah. But is that um, connected or probably not? You know, I that might have been the stretch. I'm not. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. It is pretty low. It's um. Yeah. It's significantly uh, larger than the Grand Canyon. I mean, I think it's four or five times the size. Right. So it's a very very deep canyon, and uh, it does empty through Aram Chaos and the, the Chaos areas um, into the lowlands. But I'm not sure exactly how the elevations compare. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know anything about iron carbonate? Oh, that's a interesting. So, yeah, iron car. So the carbonates that have been observed are magnesium carbonates. Um, so I don't, uh, and the carbonates observed in the dust are also magnesium carbonates. Um, iron carbonates, because of so much iron on the surface, it would have it be, I it, potentially they could be there, but I don't. We haven't found any conclusive evidence for them yet, as far as I know. Um, and I think that's because of the um, chemical. Uh, it's still very hard to form them. They're, they're fairly unstable, um, at least the iron carbonates. What was the other one? Manganese oxides. Manganese oxides. Hmm. I don't know about that one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I was struck by a photo or two that there's so much that seems to be buried um, by the top surface layer. Mm -hmm. For future rovers, is there a plan to systematically um, dig, down dig down a little bit in order to see what's there? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, you know, the next uh, step is, is more sample return. So we, as a, as a community, uh, that's where they, we hope to go uh, is a more sample return. And I, I would suspect that would be taken into consideration. So to make sure that if we're going to collect a igneous rock, if that's what the community wants, uh, that yeah, it will be taken from pretty low. Um, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, there is a lot of surface um, iron oxides in the surface that sort of obscure uh, the underlying rock. So yeah. Um, yes, we were able to use the the rat on the um, the spherules. <clears throat> Some of them were uh, so they were in a, in a uh, they were being eroded out of the rock, and so the one that I'm remembering, I believe, um, it could be uh, sanded or uh, brushed or whatever it's yeah eroded. <laughs> Use the yeah ratted. <laughs> I think is what they actually said, um, uh, and it it was harder than the um, country rock um, and. So yeah, it was in a state of erosion. So you could, we did get um, a little, some data on the hardness of that. And they are concretions. Yeah, they looked, um, there was, there was some work done in Utah uh, as um, on analog project. So there's um, a whole another area of um, Mars research just involving looking at Mars analog um, or Mars relevant uh, settings on earth. Um, and there's a place in Utah where you get these hematite concretions eroding out of the sandstone. Um, yeah. Is that like taconite? Is it um, as hard as taconite? I don't remember off the top of my head okay. the hardness of it. I, they were slightly harder. The sandstones weren't terribly hard. The, right. the basaltic yeah, sandstone, but, the, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, sorry. Yeah. So when people talk about kind of robotic versus human exploration of mm -hmm. Mars, they talk about how quickly a person on the surface could do certain things. Right. If, if you were to pick a spot that one of the rovers had been or maybe <clears> had landed, Mm -hmm. what you would be able to do right. in a spacesuit or whatever on Mars. I mean, what would, where would you go first and what would you do and oh my. how cool would it be? You know? Yeah, no, uh, I would, yeah, first, well, so um, I would probably 
<laughs> so I tell my so I teach uh, Indiana's uh, Indiana University's field course every summer. So it's a six weeks field intensive capstone geology course. And we always tell the students first thing you do is make a sketch map. And so you lay out where you're going to go, make you know, topo, you know, looking down, looking at the outcrop, you know, make your sketch map, and then you go up to the rock. Yeah. And so I think it would I would probably do that. Um, and then and then for me being I'm a rock person, not a soil person. I go directly to the rock, and you know the rock. The geologist's tools are rock, uh, rock hammer, and uh, your hand lens, um, and that's how you, you know, that's how that's that's how we do 90% of our work. Um, of course, to get at a lot of the detailed chemistry, you do, you know, do your sampling, taking your GPS, <laughs> and then probably taking it back to the lab. Um, for microscope work or, or SEM work. So I imagine, yeah, if you could get a human on the surface, though, it would be amazing how much faster you could work. Um, so it would, it would be very, very cool. Yeah. But is there a specific spot oh, that, a specific you that I would that a rover has been and you would say, man, <laughs> they've done all these tests with their laser right. and their abrasion tool. If I could just walk up to that and hit it and uh, look at it, what would you, where would you go? What would you do? Um, hmm. Out of the rocks we've seen this thus far, probably. That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't really thought about where where would I go. I mean, I think they do a fairly good job of, of going to where they see interesting uh, things. You know, so it's just the the pace at which because right. we've just got limited data uploaded. And, it's like you if, know, if you've looked at their results yeah. and said now. Yeah. We all suspect, suspect something, something going on there, and this is what I would right. want to go up and hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, no, you know, I, probably I, you would either be in Mer Mer Meridiani and looking more at more in more detail at the spherules, the blueberries, or probably going to Gusev and looking at the tephra deposits, because I think you could do a lot more um, if you're on the ground looking at the different layering, um, getting us a, a feel for the mineralogy, the variations of mineralogy. Um, the scale of the bomb sags there. Yeah, that's also probably what I'd do. River yeah, the river deltas. Yeah, if you could do a pebble, like a more detailed pebble count than, than that. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Is there an instrument in particular that you're excited about that will help your Uh, let's see. You know, they've, they're going to have another type of LIBS instrument, um, and so I think they're starting to get some heritage there. Um, so there's a so laser-induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy, so it's a, a ChemCam, if you've seen any of the MSL, yeah, it's the laser, you can shoot the laser at the rock, which is pretty cool. Um, I think that will probably give us the most um, in terms of the, the geochemistry and the mineralogy. Um, so for what I do, that I'm most excited about that. There is also um, a, uh, I think a, a new imager, uh, I think the PI is Jim Bell at ASU, that will be also pretty cool. And I think it's, um, I don't remember the wavelengths, but I, it's supposed to be pretty high resolution um, in the visible near IR. Uh, so that will be, I think, a really great um, tool as well. Um, and a new technology that, that hasn't been yet used on a rover. So that'll be awesome. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. yeah um, the online patch of Mount Sharp that Curiosity is Right. Uh, I'm assuming that's probably the lowest layer they're going to find as they climb up this mountain. Uh, yeah. How old is the estimate for that? And what is it primarily composed of? I have a slide, I believe. <laughs> um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Oh. <laughs> this was my this is my movie that I was going to show. <laughs> this is the Grand Canyon. Uh, <laughs> See, it's kind of annoying. That's why I took it out. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, that first layer. Uh, do I have an age on that? Um, or at least what the Martian era. Yeah. Let's see. You know. Yeah. So it's. Whoop, and then the rover's gonna climb. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, yeah, that it is a clay layer. Um, I. I guess I don't have an age date on that yet. Um, I would. I, my, I think from what I remember, it's probably uh, late Noachian in age, um, and but that would probably be from doing stratigraphic relationships, crater counting. So I didn't really go into crater counting that much, but that that's my. But I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. I have a question about the slide that you had with the mineral maps. Uh huh. Um, on the top right of the Hellas Basin, there's kind of concentrated all, all, all of the minerals that you showed. Okay. Uh, Hellas Basin. So Hellas Basin is a uh, fairly. I'm trying to find. It's probably. I know, I know the yeah. Basin's okay. Full, the basin's full of dust, but. Yeah. Um, top right. Like of it. Of it. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of. Um, so, th so there's Neely fossae around there. Is that? So I think that's. Probably. Yeah. Probably. So the Neely fossae um, is is very. Yeah. It's it's. Um, mineralogically diverse and interesting. Uh, a lot of olivine basalts, uh, they're olivine rich basalts, um, and that was a finding from Themis and Tess, and then there's a ton of phyllosilicates silicates there, that's actually where the carbonates are found. Um, and I think the combination of probably uh, l later stage, um, well maybe not late, later stage, but um, active volcanism with um, water uh, just in that region, I don't know, I mean I think that's, you know, the, the combination of those two factors is probably the reason why we're seeing so many different, uh, different alteration minerals in that region. Um, yeah, it is pretty uh, um, mineralogically distinct in that area. Um, might, might there just be not a lot of dust as well? Not a lot, yes, yeah, and it's also totally, it's very, very dust uh, free. Yeah, that's the, you know, so, yeah, hard. yeah it is hard. Um, the dust really does make a, um, it, it hinders what we, you know, so the volcanoes are the youngest areas on Mars and they're totally dust covered. So the SNC meteorites, like, with their ages, probably come from those areas, but we can't see uh, what those areas are, the minerals, or what, what they're like there. So it's, uh, it's kind of tough. Yeah. Is the northern hemisphere one big lava flow or do you know what the surface is? Yeah, so that's the, um, there's two kind of competing fact, um, hypotheses. The one is that it's uh, been, well, there was a giant impact. Um, and then, yeah, so it's basically very young lava flows. There's very few craters to, um, and so that would support that idea. The other hypothesis is that it was an ocean. Um, and some researchers here have shown that, you know, based on the elevations of deltas, they are consistent, excuse me, with um, a global ocean hypothesis. Um, you still yeah. have impact craters, you would think. Unless if it was an ocean, really yeah, yeah, I, it, I mean, it's, it's true. Be yes, the lake there, the what is it, the Lake Great Heavy Bombardment? Which yes, it looks like the rest of them. Right, is. right, yeah, so. yeah. I, I would agree. Yeah, it would be later than that. And so, unless it was, a, yeah, if it was an, yeah, I don't know. If it was an ocean, it would it would have existed fairly early on, and yeah, it would still probably be cratered. I'm not a particularly, I don't know if I should say that, but uh -huh. I, I think there's more evidence for volcanism and some sort of impact event than okay. the global ocean would right now, see, but... Would you see more shattering of the rest of the planet if it had been that big an impact? Yeah, that's possible too, unless it had, it was maybe not, maybe the impactor wasn't as large as that dichotomy, right. but it, that's the extent that it melted. Um, and that, some of that work, I think, was done by um, Dr. Jeff Andrews Hanna, who's down at uh, Mines. Um, and I don't remember what, I think it was using, yeah, um, but yeah, he's got, I think it was a Nature paper in maybe 2008 or so. Yeah. Yeah. I was impressed by the pictures of the lander sites and the amount of uh, unconsolidated dust, dirt, and sand. Mm -hmm. Well, so the um, some of the test data, uh, the the spectrometer data suggests that it does have a composition that's not not dust. It's it's not um, so if it was yeah so it suggests it's probably um, some sort of um, basaltic or basaltic andesite. Um, that's the dominant composition. There's also been some more work that I didn't show. I uh, don't have enough time from Chrism that there are some primitive uh, olivine enriched uh, materials in some of the very young craters there. Um, so you're kind of looking beneath uh, that the lava flows. The, this, the composition is more consistent with a lava flow than being buried, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, are, why do you think the chloride salts are concentrated in, in the south? 
So I think it has something to do, um, it's a good question and something I'm still actively thinking about. Um, I think it has something to do with uh, the, so the Southern Highlands, there's a lot of valleys. Um, so the Northern Lowlands, yeah, I, something happened and I think it pretty much wiped away most of the evidence of, um, most of the geologic evidence, what if it's impact or, or ocean. So I think um, the chloride salts are, may have existed there before whatever event wiped that surface clean. Um, so I think it's just more of a record um, in the Southern Highlands than it preferentially occurring there, if that makes sense. Like it could have, they might have uh, occurred in the Northern as well. Um, Cause I can't think of reasons why they would only precipitate in the, the Southern Highlands versus the Lowlands. Um, I mean, the Southern Highlands have uh, extensive valley networks. Um, some of the climate models suggest that precipitation did occur um, in some areas um, in the Southern Highlands. So if you, it seems like the chlorides are, um, are a surface material. They're commonly, um, I see them in channels. So like the, the channel is actually cemented chloride salt. Um, so I think it kind of represents the last pulse of, of water on the surface. Um, that's kind of my, my uh, feeling uh, based on the, the distribution. Yeah, they're. They could be. Is that? Yeah, they, potentially. I mean, I guess I, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, to be, you know, I, the northern lowlands. I mean, it's tough, and why they aren't there. Um, and so I think that has more to do with whatever whatever process wiped that surface clean than um, because the chloride salts are fairly old, um, and they do occur on. Uh, Interestingly, they don't occur in like crater basins. Um, they occur on volcanic plains. Uh, so areas that are fairly sh shallow and flat. So where you've got um, surface, it seems like surface runoff, um, but not too terribly deep. So that's also kind of an interesting uh, conundrum. Are yeah. the elevations taken from the gravitational center of the planet? Or the, what's considered zero, I guess? Oh. Um, this it's low compared to low ends or low compared to what? Right. Um, I, I don't, I think it is, yes. To, I mean, it's got its own centroid and grid, and so I don't know what their, yeah, what zero, what zero is. is. Okay. Sorry, I should know that. I, I don't. I don't work, I use, the, I'm kind of the end user of the elevation data. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I the, the squiggly lines are my thing, but, I, you know, that's, that's, sorry, I don't. I assume they probably worked it out similar to how they, Is there even a zero? Which, I, yeah. which would also lead to, is the rock more dense in the northern hemisphere, mm. giving it a lower, a lower elevation, uh, contributing to the same gravitational center? Yeah, I yeah I don't I don't know. There is gravitational data. I I don't know what it suggests for the the lowlands. Yeah. Nobody's paying attention to them. It looks like. Yeah. There. Well, there has been. Uh, I mean, there's been quite a. a vigorous research into into the lowlands as far I mean so Dr. Brian Heenick um, has worked on this global ocean hypothesis here and is a big <coughs> proponent of that um, and there has been some other um, researchers looking at primarily the morphology though I think uh, Dr. Jeff Andrews Hanna was looking at some of the gravitational data and some of the modeling so he and he might have done that and it might be suggestive of of an impact yeah that's something I, I'm not they're an enigmatic uh, um, area of Mars, for sure. So. Yeah. Do you believe the recurring slope linea are oh. really water? Oh, yeah. That's, um, I, I want to. Uh, yes. I, the fact, I, I, it does concern me that um, CRISM doesn't see any hydration. I really would think they would, um, unless it's something about the time of day or, you know, if it's just barely wetting the soil and perhaps it's not sensitive enough. Um, you know, they certainly, thank you for coming. Um, they certainly seem to, um, I mean, they're, they're finding more and more all over the planet, uh, which is interesting. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, um, and some of the modeling work, uh, I think actually, um, uh, um, da Dr. David um, Stillman at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder here um, has been doing some modeling work um, and you can get 
water, um, water with a little bit of brine, salty uh, water, and it's stable for short periods of time um, during these these episodes. Is he doing any laboratory work? Um, I that? think he's doing some laboratory work. Um, I think it's in its early stages, um, so I'm not sure how far along they are uh, with that. I think you mentioned that it, yeah. it might be just the resolution of chrism is right. spatially good it's enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, some. Uh, These aren't really big. They're like. They're very small. Yeah. They're very small. Ten meters, five meters. Apart. Right. Yeah. I think. Yeah. On that order. And so chrism's footprint uh, best is sort of you know, uh, let's see, like. 20, 30, and they have variable spatial resolution, 30, yeah. So it is, um, yeah, and and perhaps it's just a very small amount of water. I mean, the alternative is that if it's a dust, you know, settling or dust granular flow, um, the fact that they come out of some of these rock layers is interesting, though. Why would, but then I, I, you, if you go out to a desert and where did dust, where did things kind of fall from? It's like, well, if you've got an overlaying rock, consolidated unit and you've got sand underneath and you know pebbles might fall and but they're so they are very homogeneous like they all look very similar it's very the exact, exact same, same way yeah it's i know there was a theory at one point that uh, it was melting snowpack that uh, the snowpack was insulating yeah. the, the yes trickles right which allowed them to, to form channels yeah. and as soon as they came out from under the snowpack they, they evaporated right is that still viable um i have not heard for or against that. I have heard of that hypothesis. Um, Which would explain why they're over right. on one side of the crater yep. almost always. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think some of David's modeling work does still suggest that. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, or does he have a, he just gave a talk here not too long ago, and I think he touched, no, 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 actually he didn't give it. He Someone else gave a talk, but he was here and he was talking about the recurring slope linear. I'm trying to get him to come and give a talk for us um, to show some of his research. And I, I don't remember if he's still working on that. But I think it, that's still a possibility, yeah. Um, although I think a lot of them are found like in equatorial regions, but I think you can still have it still be stable. Um, yeah, they're pretty, they're, they're very interesting and yeah. Yeah, it's concerning that that chrism doesn't see any hydrated hydration, but um, but it seems like it's the most viable uh, process in my mind. So perhaps they just don't have the sensitivity or the resolution. So let me yeah. Yeah. sort of follow that then. MRO isn't going to last forever. <laughs> What's next? There's talk of a orbiter in the 2020s sometime. Yeah. What improvements would you like to see in a a new payload. A new payload. Oh, wow. Well, I would love to see um, a spectrometer that had uh, could span a, a wider uh, range uh, from maybe near IR to maybe some of the mid IR uh, with high resolution. Uh, I think there's some a new technology called like um, tunable filters. Um, so instead of the the traditional filters that we've you know kind of so Themis you know has to take a picture and then they it's it's fast but you know it's basically individual pictures that these new tunable um, filter wheels allow you to spin through them much much quicker um, I don't know what the I think with those tunable um, filter wheels is it tunable? yeah tunable laser filter I might I, I don't know if they can span that the full range um, but I certainly would like to see being you don't need a continuous spectrum you no you need bands. yeah yeah for the multi-spectral imagery that the chrism and but yeah having a, a combination sort of chrism Prism Themis uh, instrument that would be sensitive to the silicates, that the igneous min uh, minerals, as well as the hydration features of the clays and sulfates would be pretty huge. Because right, we we use we can use the two types of data sets um, cohere them together. Uh, but c because if you don't, a lot of times the um, uh, researchers that are publishing Chrism, you know, just say, oh, it's a cap rock, and so because it's just a basaltic layer, because they're not really sensitive to a lot of those minerals, they just say cap rock. Basaltic, um, but really, because you need tests or themis to say, well, is it, you know, how much pyroxene is there, how much plagioclase there. So there is a, a signature. It's just not this, those um, absorptions are not in the the near IR. And and similarly, the thermal IR, mid IR people will say, well, it's, it's you know, we don't see anything. So it's it's like, well, there it's something. <laughs> There's something there. It's just maybe we're not sensitive to it in our wavelength region. And MRO doesn't have a thermal. 
Right, right. Yeah, and so with thermal imagers too, you can get the surface t surface temperatures, which um, you know the near IR, Chrism, and Omega can't do that. Um, so yeah, so I would still I would want you know another um, a better kind of a, a vamped a souped up uh, spectrometer. Um, I think another I mean, high rise has shown us some amazing things. So another high rise type camera would be really powerful. Um, I mean, MRO, yeah. I don't know what the coverage is for high, for high rise right now, but it's not much. And so if you could just keep adding to that, that would be <laughs> not yeah, like probably five ten percent, not even. <laughs> it's not, it's no. about two. Two yeah. So part of that is because it keeps going back to the same places. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I would I would push for. I mean, yeah, yeah. Probably spectrometer. Um, maybe res higher resolution. Higher high resolution. Just, what? Maybe just higher resolution. Just higher resolution. Everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's. I mean, we do have. It's, you know, we've got almost better coverage of Mars than we do of Earth in in many ways. <laughs> but it's visible. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so. Does the atmosphere knock out your eye on Mars? Or is it not well, it's the dust. The, the dust. The atmosphere itself is it. It's the dust. Yeah, you can kind of, I mean, it, we do have that atmospheric uh, window in there, um, but we, we can still it's do a pretty. Thin. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the dust is the big. We do have water ice and, um, yeah, water ice clouds, and but they're not as significant as on Earth. Mm -hmm. Are we overdue for uh, another global dust storm on Mars? Seems like mm. it's been quite a while. Yeah, we probably are. Um, I don't know what the the predictions are, but yeah, you're, yeah, probably are pretty. It does seem to occur pretty regu with anybody, some regularity. Anybody know what the driving force is on that? Uh, that yeah, I atmospheric instability is what I I think I I know of it. Um, yeah, I, I think you know the transition from northern uh, or southern winter to yeah. yeah. So it's primarily driven by that, and I think it just kind of has a runway runaway effect. Yeah. We're about three million years too late in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have all great questions? So <laughs> thank you.